Shalom, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the Mormon Kabbalah Podcast. This week, I'd like to take a break from the Book of Remembrance. I want to stay on topic. We're going to be getting into the next chapter, the various Sephirot. Before we do, someone asked a question just before Christmas, asking if the way the Sephirot is set up and understood in Mormon Kabbalah, if that's all based on modern revelation, or if there is something in ancient Kabbalah that mirrors it. I had to do some some research to answer that question because for me, it it's all based on, on revelation. And because it's Mormon Kabbalah, it's based on modern revelation. And really, I look to Jewish Kabbalah as a guide. I believe that the Jews that receive these revelations, I believe they receive them from God, and I believe that they receive them in a way to teach the Jewish people. And so I'm not trying to usurp or steal or borrow from or take Jewish Kabbalah and make it into Mormonism. That's what the Christians did creating Christian Kabbalah. They said, hey, the Jews have these really neat ideas, but because they don't have Jesus, they obviously don't know what they're really about. And so we're we're gonna change everything and make it into Christian Kabbalah. And if that helps to build Christian mysticism, it helps to build a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. To me, that's the real point of Kabbalah, to help us understand God. And so therefore, it's going to be revealed to us in a way that makes sense. And because we're not Jews, I don't think that we as Latter-day Saints can just dip into Kabbalah and take what we want, you know, cherry pick it and throw the rest away. But because I do believe that Jewish Kabbalah comes from the same source as Mormon Kabbalah, but that it's speaking to us as Christians and speaking to them as Jews. I think that we can learn from one another, which is why I do dip my toes into Jewish Kabbalah. And to be clear when I do, and and I I do promote this website quite a bit, Kabbalah.info. Dr. Lightman, he does Kabbalah for everyone. For him, you don't have to be Jewish, even though he is a Jew. He's a rabbi. He's not trying to sell anyone anything or trying to convert them to anything. Rather, he merely teaches Kabbalah. He and his people teach Kabbalah, and it's it's very universal. I sometimes call it vanilla Kabbalah because you can take that and add any spices. You can be a Muslim. You can be a Buddhist. You can be a Christian. You can be a Latter-day Saint, and you can read his books and they make sense wherever you are. And, and I love Dr. Lightman for that. He has helped me quite a bit understand the revelations that I have received, he and his website. But back to the question then, I want it to be understood that when I receive these revelations, it's not like I'm, oh, hey, I just read this book on Kabbalah. I want to understand it. God, explain it to me. It's generally the opposite. I receive a revelation And I'm like, I have no idea what this means. I don't know what half of these words are. And so I go searching the internet and it all seems to tie back to Kabbalah. But it's not Jewish Kabbalah. But I I don't think it's something new. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to leave a couple of links in the description of this podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, they'll obviously be in the description down below. If you're listening to this, then... If you go to mormonkabbalah.org and click on the link that says podcast or listen to this podcast, it'll take you to Buzzsprout and it will be in the description there if it's not in the description on whatever platform you are listening to. But the two things I want to talk about today are one, I've I've already mentioned kabbalah.info. It's a great resource. There's free PDFs. They have classes you can take. If you really want to get into Kabbalah, like Kabbalah Kabbalah, not merely Mormon Kabbalah, I highly recommend them. I have friends that have gone through their classes and and really like them a lot also. And before making this video, there's a YouTube channel I like quite a bit. It's called Esoterica. In translating Fourth Moses, there's a lot in there that 
kind of makes me a little uncomfortable, maybe very uncomfortable when I first translated to be perfectly blunt. I love Mormonism because of the magical worldview. I, I believe in miracles. I believe that these things that happen in the Bible, that they were real and they can happen today. I've been witness. I've been privy to miracles. The Lord has asked me at times to perform miracles. And so I know these things are real from my own experience, my own eyes, my own ears, my own sense of touch. I know these things are real. But fourth Moses just gets into them in a way that would make most modern readers very uncomfortable, including myself. And so I had to do quite a bit of praying and try to figure out what are these things? And in doing my research, one of the sections in fourth Moses, it's called the cherub of Moses. And cherub is Hebrew for sword, but I didn't feel comfortable translating that to English. The Lord was very clear to me, you, know, you can put it as the sword of Moses under that, but he wanted it to say the cherub of Moses, because I, I believe because it doesn't merely mean sword the way we think of a weapon for battle or a weapon of war or a weapon of protection. And yet at the same time, I, I think it, it did mean those things. So I think the Lord wanted me to continue using the Hebrew term and keep in mind it was originally in Egyptian, yes, but the Hebrews placed over that and then over that's the English. And a lot of times there was these Hebrew words that were just spelled phonetically. And then I had to go and figure out what is a common way that people write this unless the Lord said, no, I, I want it spelled exactly like this. So in these chapters 30 through 36 of fourth Moses, there's this idea of this Cherub of Moses. So I, I went and looked at it. What is this? And I found this channel called Esoterica. And in it, it, it talks about a number of the things that are in fourth Moses, but in particular here. And so this is where I was able to get an understanding of, of what this means. Now, I'm not going to get into fourth Moses right now. I merely want to point out that if you are reading fourth Moses, I found Esoterica to have some videos on there and the scholar content that were very helpful. And so because of that, I went today back to the channel to see what videos he has on the history of the tree of life. And I'm going to be putting a link to that video in the description. It is called Kabbalah origins of the Sephirah and the tree of life. Now the video is what? 20 minutes long. So it's not too bad. I mean, my, my podcasts are about the same length, but I, I broke it down into sections here so I can discuss it with you. And he talks about the first known reference of the Sephirot coming from Sefer Yetzirah, which is the book of formation. And here he says that these 10 Sephirot seem to be tied to the numbers and, and all the numbers tied to the creation. There are people who seem to believe that this Sefer Yetzirah was more of a math book than a spiritual book. And I don't see why it can't be both. Then the next step in the evolution of the Sephirot in Jewish Kabbalah, according to Esoterica, is from Sefer Ben-Har, the Book of Brightness. And here, now there's 13 Sephirot, and they're tied to the 13 mercies of God. Now, this could be a different type of Sephirot. It could be a different understanding of Sephirot. But either way, neither of them are really the Sephirot as we understand them today. Then he talks about the Kabbalist Isaac the Blind. He comes up with a more grounded list of Sephirot and puts him into the three columns that we are familiar with. And this becomes the most popular and it's the one that, yeah, like I said, the one that we know today. And here they are tied more directly to the creation. They're the first things created. And they become identified as the emanations of God. But he points out, and keep in mind that, that the man who makes these videos, who's, the man who's in these videos, he is a scholar. He, he teaches, he's a professor, and he has a doctorate in these things. So he is, a, I'm not an expert, he is an expert. And he points out that what we see when we're looking at the Sephirot and we're looking at the tree of life, 
when we go online and we read these things, are really the most popular things in our modern culture on the topic. Now, is that good or bad? Is that right or wrong? I, I, I don't think so. The reason why I bring it up is because I want to point out that what you see when you type that into Google and you, you know, look at images or you read articles, it's not the original. And it's not the only understanding. He points out in the video that even after or around the time that this three column system was set up, there were still other examples. And if you want to watch his video, he has images in there. And one of the things I, I will point out, one of the things that really shocked me is in fourth Moses, in that cherub of Moses, at one point it, it talks about making a cloak in chapter 32. And on the cloak, you're supposed to put this, this symbol. And looking at the symbol for myself, I was like, oh, well, this kind of looks like a maze. I wonder if this is representation of the 32 paths or the 22 paths or, you know, life itself. And in the center, there are two symbols. They're not exactly Paleo-Hebrew, but they definitely aren't Hebrew. Well, 10 minutes and 30 seconds into this video, I see something. It does not look exactly like this, but it's very similar. And in the center are two Hebrew letters, Mem and Tasadi. And that reads Tsum, which means fast or deny yourself of something. And, and I'm only pointing this out because I suddenly realize this is an ancient version of the Tree of Life. And if the plates of brass are what I believe them to be, they are what they purport and claim to be, which is a record stemming from the time before Lehi leaves Jerusalem, before the fall of Babylon, then Kabbalah really is as old as we believe it is. And it also means that the things that the Lord is giving to these Jewish Kabbalists are a restoration. Now, are these secret things that have been passed down that these men, these rabbis, are now sharing with the world? Or did the Holy Spirit give them these, this information, these revelations? Or was it a combination of both? I, I don't know that we will ever know in this lifetime, and, and I'm not sure that it matters. I am sharing this with you to testify that the things that they share hold truth. And therefore, they are worth studying. And I believe that if we try to stick popular Kabbalah, I'm not even going to call it Jewish Kabbalah, Christian Kabbalah, Hermetic Kabbalah. I'm not going to call it that. I'm going to say popular Kabbalah. If we try to hold to that, then we can't have a restoration of all things. And so therefore, I want to tell you that when I first received that revelation that said, unite my people in Kabbalah. It's like, I've told you before, it's like this key was unlocked. I'd always wanted to study Kabbalah. I kept going out every every now and then. It wasn't like it was a daily thing or even a yearly thing. Just that several times throughout my life, I just felt this pull to go and study Kabbalah, but it was like it was locked to me. I couldn't find anything online. When I tried to read the books, it, it was like the words were all blurry. I couldn't I couldn't read them. And of course, I thought Kabbalah was a book, like the Book of Mormon. I thought there was a book of Kabbalah. And so when I did get books and would start reading them that I could read, it was usually someone giving me some theology. And I was like, no, I don't want a book about it. It's like, you know, it's like saying, I want to read the Book of Mormon. And someone handing you a book, you know, maybe it came from BYU, maybe it came from somebody else, but it's explaining to you what the Book of Mormon teaches by some scholar. Like, that's great. But I want to read the book itself first, and then I can see what other people think about it. That's that's the mindset I was coming from. And the reason why I bring that up is because that's the exact complaint that I would say when I would talk to people about it. I would say, I want to read Kabbalah, but I keep finding these books of theology instead. So I, I, I didn't read them because I, I didn't want to taint my mind with their theories before prayerfully going in and reading what I believed was a book of Kabbalah that I now know doesn't exist, right? When all this was unlocked to me, 
for the first time, like I had seen that picture of the tree of life before, but I didn't really know about the columns. I didn't understand what the Sephirot were. I knew that it was tied to body parts because I had seen pictures of the tree of life. And then, you know, people, their hand, you know, a person superimposed over it or behind it. And I would see where like the hands, feet, et cetera, lined up. So I, I understood that much, which, which wasn't very much. But when that key was unlocked, suddenly I could see, okay, Keter, I get it. I, the Lord was opening my mind and the Holy Spirit was teaching me. And the way I like to describe it is, because when you go to try to study Kabbalah, there's too much. There's too many different ideas out there. There's too many different theories out there. And it was like walking up to a large river with stones and alligators. And you didn't know where to walk to get to the other side. And it's like things just lit up. They glowed so that I knew where to step safely to get across the river. So with that, I'm looking at this picture of the tree of life with the Sephirot. And the Lord tells me, this is, this is not what I want you to see. He didn't tell me it was wrong, but it wasn't the right one for me. So I kept looking until I suddenly found one with a hidden Sephirot. And in the Jewish tree of life, that hidden Sephirot is Da'at. And then Bina is up at the top of the left-hand corner. And the Lord told me very clearly, this is not correct. These two need to be flipped. And I can give you my theories as to why, but to be quite blunt, they're irrevel irrelevant. What is relevant is that the Lord told me to flip them. And I'm going to tell you exactly what I said at that time. No, no, not me. Who am I to change this tradition? And I was immediately reminded by the Lord of a passage from the Book of Mormon. In 2 Nephi chapter 6, starting in verse 54 of the RAV, which is the Community of Christ or our LDS tradition, chapter 9, verse 28 of the RAV, which is the Salt Lake City Church, Book of Mormon, their tradition, O oh, that cunning plan of the evil one, O oh, the vainness and the frailties and the foolishness of men, when they are learned, they think they are wise, and they hearken not unto the counsel of God, for they set it aside, supposing they know of themselves. Wherefore, their wisdom is foolishness, and it profiteth them not, and they shall perish. But to be learned is good if they hearken unto the counsels of God. And that's when I realized that version of the tree of life is not wrong. But it's not the Kabbalah that I am to adhere to. Now, I will tell you that I did start searching to see if anyone else had done this. And I did eventually, it took me a while, but I did eventually find someone else who had the same premonition, the same idea that those two should be flipped and had also flipped them. And so that did make me feel a little comfortable, like there was a second witness of this. And that's also when, you know, in doing that search, I discovered and found that what we have today isn't the original tree of life. It's not like this tree of life that we see in books on the internet today is what originally popped up out of nowhere. This tree of life was an evolution of thought. So whether you want to say that the understanding I have been given of the Sephirot and the tree of life is the next evolution of revealed Kabbalah given for Mormonism or a restored version of what was originally taught, because I do believe that Adam had Kabbalah. I do believe that Abraham and Moses had Kabbalah. And I do believe it had to go into hiding after being conquered by Babylon. And I do believe that the Lord tried to bring it back to the Jews. And I know that the Jews had to hide certain things because of the persecution they, they faced. It's not like a Jew is going to have a revelation and print it and go door to door like you see with the missionaries of the Salt Lake City Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, right? They couldn't do that back when... Kabbalah was being rediscovered. But today, we can take what the Lord has given us. And when I say us, I mean all of us. Because Kabbalah exists in Islam, in Judaism, in Christianity. And I am sure it exists in, in other portions of the Abrahamic faith. And I believe it's a part of all the global faiths. 
I, I believe that those truths that unite all of us in global religion, like the golden rule, for example, I believe that those are all Kabbalistic teachings. All truth, in my mind, are Kabbalistic teachings. They are given to us by the Lord in a manner that we can process, understand, and live them. And so if you feel a need to go back to the Jewish Kabbalah, today's more popular understanding of the Tree of Life, I want you to feel welcome to do so. I also want you to understand that what I'm going to be explaining to you as we move forward in this book of remembrance is Kabbalah as it is being taught to me by God. That doesn't make it better or more correct because I believe that the Kabbalah the Jews have was given to them by the same God. I think that this was given to us because it's something given in a way that we can understand it. It's meant for us. And I'm going to tell you, in this Book of Remembrance, I was told that the whole purpose of the Book of Remembrance was to help us to understand the Book of Melchizedek. And the Spirit has testified to me that it's not just the Book of Melchizedek. It's the entirety of the plates of brass, the Book of Mormon, and even the Bible. And that said, today, in watching the video, I saw in there the Tree of Life from the 32nd chapter of the Book of Moses. And so the one thing that I've noticed and other people are pointing out where I don't notice it is this five books of Moses, this Torah of Moses, Zenos, Num, Melchizedek, every record that is in the place of brass that I am translating, the one thing that is seeping from it is the tree of life. It isn't always every Sephiroth. It isn't always every idea, but it is the Sephiroth that ties it together. Someone made a comment to me back when I was still translating the books of Moses, that what I was being given was the Mormon Zohar. I don't know that that's true because I believe that the Book of Mormon would be the Mormon Zohar. At the same time, the Book of Mormon is an expression of what the people, the Lehites, had. It's an expression of their understanding of their scriptures. And so, therefore, the Book of Mormon is an expression of these plates of brass. It is an expression of their understanding of Kabbalah. And so Kabbalah, once again, is what ties all of this together. The Book of Mormon is a Kabbalistic book. That's why this is called Mormon Kabbalah. It isn't really Mormonism plus Kabbalah. It's the Book of Mormon plus Kabbalah. And the plates of brass, they're what the people of the Book of Mormon studied and read. So if we want to understand the Book of Mormon, we might want to look at the scriptures that they're quoting, the scriptures that they're studying through the Holy Spirit to teach us in their writings. And that book, or those books, I should say, are the ones found on the plates of brass. But I, I want you, the listener, to kind of have an idea of where all this is coming from. So I'm going to reiterate again what I said at the beginning of this podcast, and that is, Mormon Kabbalah is not a rehashing of Jewish Kabbalah. Mormon Kabbalah is the revelations the Lord has given to us as Latter-day Saints. And yes, we do go and look at the revelations of the Jews, just like we go into the Bible. The revelations of the Jews are found in the Bible as well. Everyone that wrote in the Bible after Genesis was an Israelite. The entire Bible, Old and New Testament, that's the record of the Jews. Because Jesus was a Jew. The Christians that wrote the Gospels, the Epistles, the Revelation of John, they were all written by Jews. Never forget that. The New Testament is a Jewish book, not a Christian one. And we are following the commandment of putting the stick of Judah and the stick of Ephraim together. And how do we do that? 
it isn't just the Bible and the Book of Mormon. It's also going to be the revelations the Lord is giving to us as Ephraim, as the stick of Ephraim, in Kabbalah, and studying them alongside with the revelations the Lord has given, prophets and rabbis of Judah in Kabbalah. It's not one or the other. It's both. The Lord never stopped speaking to his people. The only apostasy was us not listening. And we know that the earth wasn't silenced because we can see the scriptures that came out between the New Testament and the Book of Mormon as given to the Jews. We may be called to do a work as Latter-day Saints, but the Jews have been restoring Kabbalah for hundreds of years now. So, please don't think that you can't look at the Jewish Kabbalah. You can't study. You can't learn from or can't have anything to do with the Jewish Kabbalah. Because the Jewish Kabbalah is what's helping me make sense of all this information, all this light and knowledge that the Lord has been given me. And so I know that if I can learn from Jewish Kabbalah to help me understand Mormon Kabbalah, so can you. And I also know that just like you're learning from me as you're listening to this podcast, I can learn from you. So I am going to plug our meetup group if you go to meetup.com slash mormon kabbalah or you can just go to cjccf.org, and up in the top where the menu is, you'll see social media icons over to the right, and about the middle, there's a little M, a little blue M and a white circle. Click on that, and that'll take you to our meetup group. We get together several times a week to discuss these things. And I want to hear from you. I want to know what your thoughts are. I appreciate your emails. I appreciate your comments on the videos. I appreciate your likes and shares. I would love it if you could make it to one of our meetings to discuss and share your thoughts on these things. Also, by the way, the last one in that social media list is to the podcast. So I mentioned earlier, you can go to mormonkabbalah.org and click on podcast. You can also just go to cjccf.org and click on that little podcast link. That'll take you to Buzzsprout also. And there's a, there's a long list of, of all the different episodes in here. And we're on Spotify. Was it Apple Podcast? Just, you know, all the major ones. If there's one you find that we're not on, let me know and I'll see how we can get on there. We have a little list here. What else what here? Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Amazon Music, Spotify, Overcast, TuneIn, Alexa, Castbox. And I also want to mention quickly if you do decide to check out the Jewish Kabbalistic scriptures, uh, the ones I mentioned today, don't get frustrated if they're difficult to understand. That's been a complaint about Kabbalah for probably hundreds of years. These books are, are not easy reads. In the, uh, the video that I linked to, the professor makes a comment that one of the books, it seems like someone wrote them out as pages, threw them up in the air, and then picked them up, and however they picked them up off the ground, that's the order that they were in. I don't think Kabbalah needs to be that way. I think Kabbalah is actually very simple. And I think that one of the reasons why the Lord's been giving me these revelations is because the message is so simple, it's being lost in all of the different Kabbalistic paths that are out there. And, and I've had people who've studied Kabbalah their whole lives tell me, this is too easy. This is too simple. What you're doing, this is Kabbalah 101. Well, isn't that what people need? A place to start? So I hope this has been a place for you to start here on this podcast, not only today, but the other podcasts as well. I hope you found it useful. And I'm really looking forward to diving into Sephiroth with you next week. So until then, shalom and God bless.